three, four, five weeks in this one little passage. Uh, maybe we can kind of just go phrase by phrase through uh, verses 1 through 7. This is probably the most detailed passage, probably the most formidable passage that really does describe the relationship of the Christian to the local government and to the government in our country. And I think it is real fitting that we really see what God says uh, concerning our relationship with government. And I just also want to tell you before we get into this, uh, just to preface that nowhere in this passage does God describe any political affiliation of the people. Nowhere in this passage does He uh, single out whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. Nowhere in this passage is there any suggestion to if the government is evil or good or fair or unfair or just or unjust. This is a blanket passage that really does cover all scopes of government in all forms. So this is very important as we look at these verses. And like I said, we'll, we'll sit here and camp here for probably three, four, five weeks, maybe a little bit longer than that, and we'll probably run through most of the Bible because this is a common thread throughout all of Scripture. But let's just kind of start today with a part one and kind of ease you into this passage and uh, just want to read verses 1 through 7, and we'll probably only get to verse 1 this morning. But chapter 13 of the book of Romans and verse 1 says this, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power to do that which is good? And thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, Honor to whom honor. Lord, we ask that as we look at these verses that you give us clarity on our relationship with our government in a way that honors you, in a way that is in full compliance with your word. Lord, that we would submit and surrender for conscience sake, being obedient to your word and what you've described here as government. And that you'd open our hearts Allow us to surrender in areas that maybe we're weak with this and areas that we need some help and strength and give us uh, more grace, more mercy, more help to live the Christian life in this world that is dark, in this world that is full of unrest. Help us to be able to shine the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in your power and in your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Romans 13, to be honest with you, these seven verses, there's nothing complex about this. Uh, there's no, uh, no confusion here. You don't have to have a seminary degree to break open these verses. It's pretty clear. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it identifies government as an institution of God. That's how Paul identifies the government here, that it's established by God in all of its forms. And it's meant for two specific reasons. Number one, to punish evildoers. And number two, to protect people who do good. That's God-ordained, established government. That's the way that God has set this up. And let me give you the key here. Our responsibility as Christians is to submit. 
to submit without political affiliation. It doesn't matter if the president is a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. It does not matter. Scripture uh, makes no hesitation. It's very unequivocal about just describing our attitude, our relationship to the government. And this entire passage is really going to start breaking forth that open. It doesn't matter the moral choices of the president or the cabinet or the Congress or anyone that's in higher power. It does not matter their moral choices, the direction they take the country. None of that matters. Our obedience to God is what matters first and foremost. Amen. And we'll get to some of those tough questions about what if the government does things that are against the word of God and the will of God? What if the government makes decisions that are not based in Scripture? How do we respond? We'll get to all of those things in this particular series. But let me start off by saying this. The, the man who wrote this particular letter, the Apostle Paul, if there was ever a man outside of Jesus Christ who suffered unjustly, unfairly at the hands of the government in his day it was the apostle paul Amen. as a matter of fact the apostle paul was in prison three separate times because of just preaching the gospel and then he was martyred for preaching the gospel and he can still say in this one letter submit to the powers that be right. no political affiliation no outlining or describing what the government's doing right or wrong and who they are and how they got there. None of that is even available in the pages of Scripture. Paul, after everything that he suffered from the government, being in prison, being in dungeons, being without clothing and food, all of those things, Paul still is saying, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. And the reason why is not because it feels good. The reason why is not because, oh, he wants to be some high and mighty Christian. The reason why is because God's word says it and that settles it in his heart. Right. It's obedience to him. Well, let me kind of give you a picture of the government in these days. In the days of our Lord, in the days when the Apostle Paul is writing this particular letter. Let me just give you a little, a quick little view of some of the ruler's that were occupying the land at that time. And the first thing that was really evident in this culture, in this society around the times of Jesus and into the Apostle Paul's era was that they had what's called absolute rulers. No one had a voice. It didn't matter who you are, how much money you had, they lived in an era where they were absolute rulers. There was <laughs> unilateral power and authority singularly with one man and that is Caesar whoever the Caesar was he was the only one that had and could execute singular unilateral authority and guess what he enslaved millions he killed millions and during the time of our Lord it was Julius Caesar and you know anything about his background? He was a madman. He was a pedophile. He was a murderer of mothers. Killed his first and second wife. Killed three of his own sons. A murderer, a madman, and he ruled with an iron fist. He ruled with an iron fist so much so, and for so long, that they plotted a coup against him. His own Roman Senate plotted a coup against him and as he enters into the Senate floor, his own senators stampeded him and stabbed him hundreds of times and murdered him right on the Senate floor in hopes that that unilateral power that he possessed would never be executed again. Little did they know the next Caesar who would be Augustus, they thought that they saw in Augustus what they didn't like in Julius Caesar. And little did they know that once someone gets a taste of power and they're already evil and wicked in the heart, they continue to run with that same power. And so, so the Roman Senate, they appoint uh, Caesar Augustus. 
in hopes that he would be a little bit more democratic in his way of governing the daily affairs. But little by little, he became power hungry as well. He had such an influence over the Roman soldiers that he was not only a seizure, but he was also the commander-in-chief of all of the soldiers and all of the armies. He was already towering above all of the senators and his intellectual stamina. He controlled all civil affairs. He had all power. And some people, even in this part of the world, when that was taking place, even deemed him to be a god, to be worshipped. Statues, bowing down to the statues, saying, Hail Caesar Augustus. I mean, that's how far his power literally went that Rome, in a way, invested all their power into one man yet again. And then you had... In Israel or the land of Palestine, you had the puppet King Herod who had power nonetheless, a unilateral power as well because he was placed in position by Caesar himself. And Herod, he has a, a long history of mental health issues. He was paranoid on every turn, on every corner. He also killed his wife killed two of his sons, and he murdered thousands and thousands of infants below the age of two years old. You remember in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 2. That was King Herod. Had so much unilateral power that he could just execute a massacre on thousands and thousands of babies and no one ever challenged him one bit. That's how much power he had. That's a lot of power for one man to be able to just massacre that amount of people and never even be held responsible for all of the evil that he's done. And so not only was that going on in this culture, in this society, at the same time that that was going on, taxes were heavy. Taxes were so heavy, were so burdensome, that most of the people in this society could either A, not pay them, or they were enslaved to get out of the debt that they owed to pay the taxes. And tax collectors were Jewish. The ultimate betrayal. A Jewish tax collector robbing and thieving Jewish people and then taking their money and giving it to the Roman government so that they could build their armies to control the Jewish land even more. That was the ultimate betrayal. And two of which we know in Scripture is Zacchaeus, whose heart was changed. And Matthew, the tax collector, whose heart was changed. I mean, taxes were, were so heavy on the people. In Rome, constantly, the pressure, the authority, the, the, the unilateral power to execute anything and everything onto whomever they wanted to, it was unbearable, plus the taxes on top of that. And Caesar Augustus had so much power also that, remember, he was able to call a tax on the entire land. In the Greek, the word is the entire world. That is, he had so much power over the known world that you remember in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 how he calls a tax on the entire world and makes everybody that's outside of their country to come back to their particular towns and cities and countries so there would be a census, but all of it was so he could tax everybody to identify where they lived and how many people and then, in, then put a tax on them. And you know that God and His great providence worked through those means to navigate Mary and to navigate Joseph into Bethlehem to where Jesus would be born. And so Caesar Augustus is looking for money, but God is looking to birth the Son of God. Even God working through 
the means of an evil government to overpower evil and bring out a necessary Savior and a good in the middle of that. Beautiful story. He's in control of providence. Absolutely no one had a voice in this society. And you might say, why in the world would I ever give these people a dime? Why would I ever pay taxes to the Roman government if they're evil and unjust and wicked and unrighteous in everything that they do? Why in the world would I pay my taxes to some government like that? Well, don't forget Matthew 22, 21, and Jesus says, Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. There's the separation. Even Jesus living in that culture, in that society, even Jesus living under the tyranny of that Caesar, knowing all of his evils, knowing all of his unjust practices, even Jesus teaches his disciples, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And a matter of fact, there's a fish right there in the lake. Peter, and go get it. There'll be a coin right in his mouth, and you give that to him. I mean, that doesn't seem holy and pure. That doesn't seem righteous from the very hand of God saying, submit to the authorities and render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And you remember the story, he takes the coin out of the fish's mouth and he, he, he has the disciples there huddled around him and he says, whose image is on this coin? He says, it's the image of Caesar. And then Jesus begins to teach the great truth about no matter what the government does and who the government is and what moral decisions they make that direct human society, you still give Caesar what is due to Caesar. That must have been a baffling principle to learn from those young disciples who lived under that tyranny before Jesus even showed up. But yet Jesus teaches that. And here's the key. And this is the reason why. Because Jesus, not one time, ever in His proclamation, in His ministry, ever came to seek social change. That wasn't His message. That wasn't His mission. That wasn't His mandate. Jesus' mandate was never to come to this world to seek any type of social change, to come and alter the tax code. He didn't come to try to address any economic issues at all. That was not His message. Was He fully aware of every single unjust thing that ever transpired in the earth under every pagan government, under every evil government? Absolutely. He's fully 100% God and has infinite wisdom and knowledge of things before they ever occur. Right. But not one time in His message, not one time in the Gospels, not one time in His ministry, did He ever attack and try to seek any social change, not one time. Amen. How's that for your rights? How's that for your protests? How's that for your rallies? How's that for, oh, we're just standing in the face of injustice? He never came to bring a social revolution because he knew that the way that a Christian has the most impact and influence on the powers that be is that we live a quiet, peaceable life that's full of the Spirit of God. Prayer is more powerful than a protest. Amen. Your knees on the ground are more powerful than a sign held up high with writing on it. Right. And not one time did Jesus ever appeal in any social injustice ever. And I know for some people that really startles them in this world. Because you see so much wrong. Well, guess what? When you look in the Bible, you see ten times more wrong than what we see today. And not one time do you ever see the apostles, the disciples of Christ, ever rallying ever to go against the government. Not one time. The last time I checked, every apostle was either martyred or outcast. 
Jesus' appeal was to the hearts of men. And here it is. Jesus' appeal was to the hearts and souls of men to be changed and transformed. In that transformation, you will get social change. When someone is born again, when someone is made a new creature, when someone has their sins forgiven, when someone has the Spirit of God uh, implant uh, unconditional love and mercy and long-suffering and forgiveness in their heart, the fruits of the Spirit that are produced by a real, genuine Christian, when that takes place and that occurs on a local level, on a global level, on a level in the country, then you will see real social change. Amen. You can't get social change from the outside in. You must get it from the inside out. Right. And that's what Jesus taught. And that's what He appealed to. And the reason why is because Jesus understood that politics of the world really have no bearing on the kingdom of heaven. They really don't. And I know in your mind, you're, it's spinning and you're saying, well, what about my vote? Does my vote count? Absolutely your vote counts. Absolutely your vote should be towards the person that lines up with this book the most. Amen, that's right. Absolutely the Christian has a voice in this world to speak out against injustice and to speak out against unfairness and to speak out of thing, uh, things that are falsehood. Absolutely the Christian has a voice, but don't ever underestimate and don't ever misunderstand that no vote in this world, no president in power, no Congress in power can have any bearing on anything eternal. Right. Only in this world. And the last time I checked, Jesus said His kingdom is not of this world. Right. So at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is getting the gospel out. Amen. It's getting people to understand who Jesus Christ is, that you can have full forgiveness of sins through Him and Him alone. That's where your social change starts. That's where your spiritual revolution starts. It starts in the hearts of men who've been transformed by the power of God. Amen. Jesus wasn't interested in any social orders or changing governments. He tells Peter, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. I know who Caesar is. I'm God. I know what he's done, what he hasn't done. I know what he's doing right now while I'm telling you to give him taxes. And I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in you submitting to the government, therefore you submitting to God himself. And that's what Paul's saying in Romans 13. In verse 1, he's just an extension of what Jesus taught his disciples. Let every soul... Be subject to the higher powers. Uh, stop right there. That's God's design for any culture, any society to function. That's His design right there. Doesn't matter if it's fair or not fair. And notice in verse 1 it says every soul. An interesting phrase in the original language is, is dipsuke. It's a, it, it means people who are outside the sphere of the body of Christ. So what he's saying is this is just not Christians are to submit and subject to higher powers. Every dipsuke, every single soul that has ever been born on the face of this planet, they are all to subject and surrender under the higher powers. Everyone. Every believer, every unbeliever, this is the God-ordained mandate from heaven. A society and a culture will not work unless this is submitted to. But the context is pretty, pretty amazing here, to be honest with you. Let me kind of break open the context for you so we can kind of grasp chapter 13 a little bit more. Look over at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. This is kind of... The context, if you ever study the book of Romans in depth, you'll know that chapters 1 through 11 are 
the doctrinal, the theological portion of the book of Romans. From chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11, all Paul does is pour out doctrine and theology. And then from chapter 12 all the way to 16, it is application time. It's Paul saying, listen, I've given you a whole head full of knowledge. I've given you a whole head full of theology for 11 chapters. Now it's time to apply everything I have taught you. And that's why verse 1 in chapter 1, chapter 12 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. It's Paul saying, listen, everything I just said, I'm going to wrap it all up right now. Therefore is there to culminate everything he said previously and now goes into the application part and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We know that verse. We love that verse. We, we quote that verse all the time. And right here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul is saying, listen, you submit yourselves to God. You submit your body to God as a living sacrifice. You submit everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you can be. You submit everything to God. Romans 12, 1. And in Romans 13, 1, he says you submit everything that you have, everything that you are to the higher powers. That's the government. I know we've heard this cliche our entire life, and I just want to tell you it's not biblical. Oh, church and state doesn't mix. Oh, church and politics don't mix. I know we've heard that. I know you've heard it preached a million times. But let me tell you what Paul is doing in Romans 13. God and government, he's putting it right here in the same chapter. I understand the Great Reformation. I understand the uh, uh, church and state to be separate and, and all of those, those things and all of those decisions. I understand the argument, but right here in Romans 13, Paul is saying God and government, here it is, right here in the same chapter. The government has been established. God ordained and establish the institutions and the governments in this world. It's right there. Right. And that's the hierarchy. The hierarchy is God Himself and everything else flows out from the authority and power of God. Governments all the way down to communities and everything else. It's right here in Romans 13. Amen. There is a place for it. But in Romans 12... It's the God part. In Romans 13, it's the government part, which is still the God part. In all of Romans chapter 12, Paul begins to say, these are the areas that you are to present yourselves as living sacrifices. And from verses 3 all the way down, he just starts opening up different categories on what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. In verse 3, he says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Um, here's application. Be humble. Live a humble life. Uh, live a life of sobriety, a, a life that, that is not prideful and arrogant. And down in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Here's another practical principle that Paul is directing the believer not only to, to live a life that's humble, but here to let love with, be without hypocrisy is what that word means. That means don't be one way with someone one day and then the very next the next day. Don't change colors like a chameleon when you change groups and circles that you find yourself in. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Let your love be through and through no matter who you meet, no matter where they're at in their lives, no matter what they've ever done. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Amen. Right. Verse 10, be kind, affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one 
another. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continue. I mean, on and on, chapter 12 is just Paul saying, listen, I've given you all the information, I've given you all the knowledge, I've given you all the theology and doctrine, now is to put all that stuff into your daily life. Because I want to tell you, there's a lot of people in the church that have a lot of information, but they never apply it out here. And Paul is saying it does no good. You need, to, you need to work on these categories. Loving people without hypocrisy. Being, being good in business and fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. Look at verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible... As much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That there's no chapter 13 in the original Bible. This continues to keep going. And what Paul is saying is this, there's going to be some areas that you think in your heart and in your life where the government is evil and they are wrong and you're not going to want to submit to them. And Paul is saying, listen, God will do the avenging and never recompense evil. Always good. And that's the context. The context is present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. How do we do that, Paul? You do that by loving without hypocrisy. You do that by being fervent in business. You do that by not recompensing evil. You do that by allowing God's visions to take its place and not your wrath. And whatever you do, make sure you submit to the government. Amen. It's all hand in hand. Because the person that's writing this has absorbed a lot of evil from the hand of the government. And he's still saying, submit. You know, it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to actually go through it and say it and do it. And that's what he's doing here. That's what Paul is doing. This amazing skill of Paul, the great theologian, he leads them right to this truth. Because you know some people are going to say, well, hold on, Paul. This government? You mean this government that's imprisoned you three separate times? You mean this government that is, that is ruled and dictated by a madman? The one that's killed his own mother and killed his own wives and killed all of you talking about we are to submit to this government? And Paul says, yes, this government let me get you closer. You ever heard of the word, the person's name, Nero? Well, that's who's in charge right now. In Romans chapter 13, Nero is in charge. He has just took the throne three years prior to this. He is 19 years old. He's a kid. And he would be one of the most wicked rulers ever on the face of this planet. All you got to do is just Google Nero and you'll read thousands of pages of all of the atrocities that he ever did and here's one of them he murdered his own mother cold blood by murder murder once again he murdered his first wife and second wife there was just something about murdering wives back then i don't understand that part but just about every caesar murdered his wife one of the biggest atrocities that nero has been known for and has always been a part of contention is Nero was so infatuated with gold and statues and the shiny things in the city and the glamour of the city. And when Nero took over in Rome, there is this theory that Nero burned the city down himself. 
He had some thugs run out there and burn the city down because he wanted a clean slate and he wanted to build all his golden statues all over the city. And the city that he lives in, the city that he loves, the city that he was ruler over, he burned it down to the ground so he could build more statues. And you know what he did? He blamed it on the Christians. He said, oh, it's the Christians. It's their revolt, their revolution against the government. You see that, that, that little circle of Christians, those Jesus freaks, those Jesus people over there with all of those pickets and signs and standing in the face of, of law enforcement? You see, those are the ones that burn the city down. They want a social reform. They want to change everything. And that gave Nero the opportunity to go literally on a massacre against Christians. Because people bought into it. And you know what he did? This is just some of the ways that he tortured people. He would take Christians and he would clothe them in animal skins. And he would sick dogs on them to literally eat them alive. He would not just do that. He would, he would line the streets coming into Rome or into any occupied territory. He would line the streets with Christians who've been impaled on stakes. So when you came riding into a town or a city and you had that little blur of a thought that maybe you could take it over, you might want to think again. It was there to demonstrate fear in the hearts of surrounding emperors <coughs> or people who wanted to take over. Another way that he thought was kind of neat to kill Christians is he had these lavish gardens in separate locations where they would have all of their parties and all of their feasts. And he thought it was pretty to, you know, I need a little bit of light in my gardens. Don't have electricity. Don't have any type of generators. And so he would literally dip Christians in oil and pale them on a stake and set them on fire. And those would be the lights for the night. That's what Nero was all about trying to strike fear into people's hearts. That's the same Nero that was in power when Paul says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That brings a whole different light on what we see today in our world. It's not even close to this. Nowhere even close to this. Right. But yet Paul is still saying, subject to the higher powers. And the reason why is we just read it in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. If there's vengeance to be had, God will be doing that. Leave it to Him. And there's a, another couple things here that's important. When you study Jewish history, you know that the Jewish people, they prided themselves on their oneness with God and their singular love towards God all through the Bible, whether they're right or wrong through the Scripture, it was just some type of genetic makeup that God put in Jewish people so they really love their heritage. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying they are very prideful people with their heritage. I mean, they won't even give an inch where they're at right now in the Holy that's why there's so much contention there. And they shouldn't because the covenant is clear in the Scripture that that land is there. But saying that is to say this, that the Jews hated the Roman occupation. They hated it. And that's why they missed who Jesus actually was. Because the Jews hated Roman occupation so much so that they thought when Messiah showed up, Messiah would be this general and this king who would come and relieve them from the oppression of the Romans. And he came to relieve them from the oppression of sin in a spiritual manner. Right. And that's why they missed him so much. And so saying that, the Jews hated the Romans so much that they tried to fight back so many different times. Go to Mark 15. I want to show you a couple of things. Like I said, today's just kind of a precursor to kind of get us in the flow of this thing. Just set the context up. Mark chapter 15, I want to show you a person over here that 
tried to fight back. I want to show you a couple people that tried to fight back towards a government that was evil and hostile to the people. Uh, Mark 15, you remember this story that Jesus has pretty much already been tortured and he's been brought out in front of the people. And you remember there was a guy that was there in verse 7. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Well, you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. The chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas on it. Now what I want to show you is we often miss this because we're so caught up on what's going on with Jesus and how unjust it is for them to release Barabbas who is a murderer. But Barabbas was a Jew and Barabbas was an insurrectionist. Barabbas was one of those who tried to fight back against the government. And in the process of his rioting, in the process of his protesting against an evil government, which he was right, he murdered a man. And that's why he was in prison. And he gets released here because he has the Savior of the world next to him. And the people have blood eyes and that's all they want to see is blood shed from the Messiah. But Barabbas is one of those and caused a violent uprising. And you can read in history exactly what he did. There's chapters upon chapters of how he tried to go against the ruling government and killed someone in the process. And this was common in these days to fight against the government. Let me show it to you again. Go to Acts chapter 5. It's so ama amazing the wonder of Scripture and how Scripture is still relevant today. That there's nothing new under the sun. Right. Acts chapter 5, here, here's, here's another protest, if you will. And I don't, not by any way, making light of any protest that would seek for justice or change, but I want to tell you that's not the Christian one. It's not the way Scripture teaches. And we'll get to some of that. Acts chapter 5, here it is right here, verse 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So this is Peter. Peter has just got done preaching. Verse 34, Then stood there up one in the council of Pharisee named Gamaliel, which is the teacher of the Apostle Paul a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And so what's happening here is Peter has been preaching in the town and the government, the civil authorities have told Peter to shut it up. Don't speak the name of Jesus in this town. And so they arrest them, they take them. And then so Gamaliel, which is actually a Pharisee, who is not saved, who's not born again. He's the actual teacher of the Apostle Paul. Before he's converted, he says, listen, hold on before you go any further with this situation. Give them a little bit of space here. Give them a little bit of room. Let's try to reason this thing out. And why does he say that? Verse 35, and he said unto them, you men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. What you intend to do is touching these men. For before these days rose up Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain. And as all, as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to none. Uh, what Gamaliel says is this, is listen, do you remember what happened in the past when we did this? When we did this, there was a, an insurrection of 400 people rose up and rioted. And guess what? They all perished and died because the government stamped it out just that fast. Right. So he's pleading with the people, don't touch these disciples because if you do, there's going to be backlash here. Let's try to make this thing as smooth as possible. And then he brings up another in verse 37. After this man rose up, 
Judas of Galilee, in the days of taxing, and drew away much people after him, he also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say to you, refrain from these men, let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily be found even to fight against God. And there's the truth right there. Amen. Every person that fought against an evil government perished. And the truth that comes out of Gamilalil's mouth, who is an unbeliever, says, listen, let them continue to do what they're doing, preaching the name of Jesus. And if they're doing it out of selfish gain, out of getting notoriety from man, then it will come to nothing. But if it's of God, no one can withstand it. That's right. Amen. And guess what? Not one, nowhere in here do the disciples protest or anything. They just keep preaching the name of Jesus. That's all they do. There's no protest here. The protest is from the people who perish. And right here in this one single story, you get to see the two different ways that people respond to an evil government. People who perish and people who don't. Nowhere in here is there a struggle with Peter and the apostles when they're taken into custody where they're standing there literally on trial for the moment and Gamaliel comes in and says don't touch them you remember what's happened in the past every time we call something we wind up killing everybody in the protest leave them alone they're not fighting they're not protesting they're standing there with their strength in God and knowing that if they get arrested God has allowed if they get freed God has allowed that's what's going on here. It's all over the place. That's a hard truth to really absorb, to be honest with you. Especially when you see so much stuff going on in our world and sometimes the government's at the epicenter of it. Go to Titus chapter 3. Let me give you a couple more verses here. I tell you, sometimes... I have pastor friends in Tallahassee. I have pastor friends in Perry. And I sometimes, I have to get off social media because I say something that people will get mad at me about. But I, 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 to be honest with you, I, I watched a couple days ago at Cascade Park in Tallahassee where there was probably a couple thousand people out of the Cascade in Tallahassee and there was this pastor, Pastor Griffin, who was supposedly trying to lead a peaceful protest. And almost every word out of his mouth was something against the government. A peaceful protest for a pastor should have been displaying the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to the people who need it, not attacking the government. And that's all this pastor did for 45 minutes while there was literally two or 3,000 people out there just chanting and, and, and away, yes, and yeah, there was no violence there. There was no violence at all. It was peaceful. Everyone was, everyone was standing there and everyone was happy and everything. But the pastor had just prostituted his mandate by God to give all of these people the gospel when the gospel is the most needed thing in the world. At that time, he attacks the government doing totally antithetical to what Scripture teaches. And then he was maneuvering Scripture in his speech and taking it all out of the context. He was using the story of Lazarus, Lazarus coming out of the tomb and how Jesus Christ called Lazarus out of the tomb and brought life and called Lazarus out of the tomb. He said, Tallahassee needs to come out of the tomb and God needs to give Tallahassee. I mean, it was a debacle. And all of the comments were, we love this pastor and we love this and we love, and he just wanted to be heard. He could have went into a, a speech somewhere else and did that. And you see it all over social media. Pastors are wanting to protest and get out and rally with the people. 
And Titus 3.1 tells us what we're supposed to do. Supposed to do. And like I said, if, they, if pastors want to dabble in politics, dabble away. Me, I'm going to dabble in this. Amen. Right. I'm not going to dabble in politics. Titus chapter 3. Once again, Nero is still in charge. Verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Watch this. To speak evil of no man. Oof. That's a tough one. And guess what it's in context with? It's in context of government. So every time you see someone post some little funny little thing about Donald Trump or any of the presidents that we've ever had and they say evil stuff like I saw last night, someone put Donald Trump on social media and said it's a cult. Well, you just went against and violated scripture in a bad way. Because guess what? Donald Trump will have to give an account to God if he's done anything bad. Right. The same way Obama will. The same way any of them will. It doesn't matter. The, the, the question isn't Democrat or Republic. The, the question is God has told us to submit to the governing authorities and to not speak evil of them. And that's hard for us because especially as Christian people and we look at the values in the Bible and we look at some of the precedents that we've had and they're so far from biblical examples. And we want to speak out against them and we want to attack them. And we have to understand that God's in control. He knows exactly what He's doing. But once again here, Titus in this letter is saying we need to be meek and not speak evil. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. I mean, it's all over the place. And once again, I, I, I want to bring you into the reality that where these people lived here is a thousand times worse than we'll ever experience. And they're still able to do it here. Look, like, these letters aren't towards some mediocre government that's, that's treating the pay, people kind of fair, and then there's some things that the people really dislike. No, no, that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is the people that are in power here are murderers. They're madmen. They're crazy. And they're still, Christians are submitting this way. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, here's the key, for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as to them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Watch this. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Oof. Well, if you're a Democrat, that hurts right there. I know it does. That hurts. That hurts because what's that saying that is saying that God is still in complete control and that He has ordained the government that is. And then we're supposed to honor that. Honor the king. How in the world can Peter say that when Nero is the king right now? That's the Bible. It's biblical. And so I want to say this loud and clear. And I'm not taking punches either way. You have to be very, very careful the way you speak about the government because God has ordained the government. Whatever His means, 
whatever his purposes are by using a particular government or a particular president, whatever his means are, whatever his plan is, only he knows the future and what his plan is to use a particular government. But when Christians resist a government that God has established, you do the math, you're resisting the hand of God. It's that simple. It's that clear. You have to be careful because the rashness of our mouth will get us in a lot of trouble with God. Amen. And Scripture is clear with this all the way through. Honor the king. It doesn't say if you're a Democrat. It doesn't say if you're a Republican. It doesn't say if you're independent. It says just honor the king. That's what it says. Go back to Romans chapter 13 and we'll close up here. Romans 13, verse 1. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That little word subject is a very important word. It's actually a military term in the original language, and it's hupas. It's, it actually is two little Greek words. Uh, one word, huper, is the prefix to it. It means to be under something. And so it became a military term, and military commanders used to use the word who parse or who pair. And what it mean, meant, it meant that all the soldiers that were under an acting commander, they would get in line under him. The minute he said something, they would fall in line. The minute he would chant a mantra, they would get in line. There was nobody scattered or out of place. Everyone came in under the commander-in-chief and they got in line with his agenda and his direction. A soldier doesn't tell a commander anything. He just gets in line. When a commander wakes the barracks at 2 o'clock in the morning and says, it's time to win, run 7, 10 miles, you don't say anything. You get in line. You're under control of that commander. No matter if the commander is good or evil. No matter if he's fair or not fair. No, no matter if he won't let you get mail or, or not get mail or won't let you eat for a certain amount of time. And time. No matter what, it just says get in line. Without qualification, without caveat, there's no restriction anywhere in the Scripture. doesn't matter if he's Christian or pagan. And the reason why is because it all comes down to the obedience of the Christian to the God who ordained government. And that's, you, that's the bottom line. And that's hard for us because we want to be in control of so much stuff. It's a hard pill to swallow. Especially when you look at all of the Christian freedoms that have been taken. No prayer in schools anymore. Ten Commandments have been done away with in the courthouses. Abortions all over the place. I mean, all kind of stuff that, that go contrary to Scripture and are produced in these circles that, that are against God. And Scripture is still saying, Submit. Still saying, fall under line of the government because he will take care of it all. I'm going to leave this with you, and I know we've bounced around a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll close right here. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. This is something I always, I always have to go back to these verses when I see something that doesn't sit right with me, that the government or someone does. I have to come back to these verses because this is my duty. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God 
our Savior. My duty is to pray. That's my mandate. My mandate is when I see something going wrong, when I see unrest in the world, uh, when, when I see that, that governments and Congress people are, are attacking the Scripture or going against the Scripture, whoever they are, my mandate is to pray for them. To pray that they would come 